All right. So let's talk about our next phylum, the uh, uh, annelids or the phylum annelida. These are the segmented worms and leeches. So these are some organisms that you are probably familiar with. So if we look at our um, cladogram, our phylogenetic tree here, we see that um, the annelida are closely related to the mollusca, which we talked about last week, or we dissected last week. And they have a recent common ancestor with them. So this is somewhat surprising. I mean, if you look at a snail or a, a squid or a um, clam and an earthworm or a leech, you wouldn't think that these two things are closely related. But um, the data suggests that they do have a recent common ancestor. Um, what kind of things do they have in common? Uh, again, for each of these phylum, for each of these phyla, we want to think about the differences um, from the previous phyla. We want to talk about how these things evolved, um, the different characteristics that evolved over time to make each of these groups unique. Um, so last week, we first started to see a salomic cavity in, for example, the freshwater mussel that we dissected, but it wasn't well developed. Uh, but it's more developed in the earthworms and the other annelids. Uh, the annelids have a closed circulatory system, and you'll remember that some of our mollusks had an open circulatory system, but the ones that were more active, the cephalopods, they had the closed circulatory system. So we started to see the evolution of a closed circulatory system in that group, and now we see it in all the members of this group. Um, we're seeing more developed excretory system. We saw that um, last week, you know, relative to some of the other organisms, the excretory system of the mollusks was more developed, and it's even more developed in the um, annelids. Uh, a complete gut, we saw that for the first time in the mollusks, and again, we're seeing that in this group. Uh, a brain, so a development of the nervous system. And um, one of the things that is unique and that leads us to believe that this group is, cl is closely related to the mollusks is that they have similar larvae um, called the trochophore larvae. And this is a picture of one right here. It's a very unique looking larvae. Um, and most mollusks have this type of larvae in their development. Now, last week, we talked about villagers and how we talked about in mussels, those villagers can turn into glochidia, and those glochidia go and parasitize fish. But the original larva, uh, larval form looks like this, this trochophore larvae. And what's interesting is that in one group of the annelids, um, the sea worms um, also have a very similar type of larvae. And so on the surface, if you look at the adults, you wouldn't think that there was um, a close relationship between these two organisms, but because we looked at the larvae, we can see that, yes, they are actually closely related. And this, of course, is backed up by things like DNA and other um, sources of information. Okay, well, what are some of the characteristics of this phylum? It is uh, the segmented worms, and so the first obvious characteristic are the segments that you're going to see. I mentioned that the salome is more developed. The excretory system is more developed. Uh, one of the other things that we're going to be looking at as we dissect them are the setae, or the setae. These are hair-like structures that are on each segment that uh, they sometimes use for locomotion and things like that. Um, we can also compare these to the flatworms, um, the phylum that we did a while ago, the platyhelminthes. Remember, or re realize that, you know, anything that's long and thin, we call it a worm, right? But not all worms are closely related. And so, um, you know, the annelids are not closely related to the platyhelminthes. And we're going to talk about the roundworms next. And they're also not closely related. So just because something is a worm doesn't mean it's going to be in the same phylum. You've got to be able to tell the difference between the different kinds of worms. Um, so again, this is um, earthworms, uh, leeches, uh, the earthworms and the freshwater worms we call ligachetes. Um, or the polychaetes, which are the marine worms. And so you're familiar with some of these leeches you've seen before. And again, you can tell they're, they're related to the earthworms and they're in the annelida because of the segments. Um, the leeches are kind of cool. They have um, suckers on either end of their body, which allows them to hold on to their uh, the organism that they're parasitizing. And then they've got these really sharp, 
teeth arranged in in this unique order and so then they can kind of just cut a small hole and suck the blood and they release anticoagulants which allow the blood to keep flowing and also a little bit of anesthetic so you don't feel it when they bite into you um, and so here's just another example of a leech attached to someone and then you can see the characteristic um, shape of the bite mark that's left by those teeth whenever they attach to you and suck your blood. Um, you may be familiar <clears throat> that uh, leeches were once widely used um, medically, and there's actually a specific species of leech that is used, uh, Herudu medicinalis. Um, originally, you know, hundreds of years ago, uh, diseases were thought to be called by having too much blood, right? And so bloodletting was a way that you tried to cure people. And one of the ways that you would try to get rid of some of that blood was to, be, to apply leeches to them. Well, obviously that's, that's not, um, you know, that's not how, what causes diseases. That's not a good idea, but this was hundreds of years ago. However, these medicinal leeches have been approved by the FDA as a medical device. And this might be the only living animal that actually qualifies as a medical device. So your doctor can prescribe leeches to you in certain circumstances. They're most often used in things like plastic surgery, where you've got lots of very fine blood vessels that get um, you know, cut or um, damaged during surgery. And <clears throat> until those blood vessels can grow back and um, repair themselves, blood does not flow through the area very well and that blood becomes deoxygenated and then you can start to get um, necrosis and tissue death and so having that blood pool up is a problem and so this would be a situation where you could use a medicinal leech and you would just apply the leeches and the leeches would uh, suck away that excess blood until your vessels could repair themselves until normal blood flow could be restored so um that's actually a thing, is that doctors can prescribe leeches. Um, the next uh, class, the oligochetes, uh, are earthworms, and you're probably familiar with earthworms. You've seen earthworms before. Uh, someone who was fascinated by earthworms was Charles Darwin. In fact, he did a ton of work on earthworms, and the last book that he published was this book on earthworms, and he um, had lots of fascinating studies that he did with them. So. Um, there are several kinds of these uh, freshwater or terrestrial earthworms. Um, and you can see, again, the fairly typical ones that you're used to are shown here. <clears throat> the salomic cavity is more developed in the annelids. And in these earthworms, it's used as a hydrostatic skeleton. And so it's like either blowing up a balloon or pumping water into a balloon. It provides turgidity or rigidness. And so by increasing the pressure inside that body, it makes it stiffer. And so instead of having a, a solid internal skeleton like we do, they have this hydrostatic skeleton. And so that's one of the advantages of a more developed salomic cavity. So here's a cross section from a figure in your book, just kind of showing some of the different structures in the earthworm. And you'll notice here that they've got these two kinds of muscle. They've got circular muscle that wraps around the segment, and then they've got longitudinal muscle that runs along the long axis of the worm. And so that circular muscle can contract and decrease the diameter of each segment, whereas that longitudinal muscle can contract and make the worm turn left and right. They've also got these structures that I mentioned earlier, called setae, or setae, however you want to pronounce it. These are made of chitin. You remember we talked about chitin. It's a um, carbohydrate. It's often found in the um, exoskeletons of insects or the cell walls of fungi. Um, but these setae are like stiff little bristles or stiff little hairs that they can um, control with muscles and they can extend or retract. And those are important in uh, locomotion. And so here's a figure from your book <clears throat> showing how a typical um, earthworm is going to move. And so starting at one end, those circular muscles contract, and that decreases the diameter of the segment. 
but because of the hydrostatic skeleton, uh, it, it's got to go somewhere, and so it gets you know smaller in diameter, but it elongates. And that's what they're showing you in this figure, is that as, as it gets squeezed smaller, it has to elongate, which makes those front segments move forward. When those segments move forward, those setae grab into the substrate, and then as that circular muscle relaxes, then the, the segment returns to its original diameter, and so then it shortens back up. And so in this way, it can stretch out, grab, and then pull itself forward and you get this wave of this um you know stretching and um contracting that moves down the worm and so it just kind of you know stretches forward grabs hold relaxes and it pulls the whole body forward and it just keeps doing that and so that's how these worms are able to to move along the ground or in the ground um and then of course like i said those longitudinal muscles help it turn left and right um, so it can move um, you know, in any direction it wants to. And so you're seeing, again, more complicated musculature, more complicated movements um, in, so, in some of these new phyla that we're looking at. Um, some of these annelids can get really big. Here's an example of a giant earthworm from Australia. Now the last class um, that's within the annelids are the polychaetes. And these are marine worms. They're also called bristle worms because they have these um, larger bristles. And so this is sort of, uh, these are made of chitin, so they're, they're like these setae. Um, they extend off of every segment, but they're more, um, you know, they're more obvious than the setae are. Um, the marine worms are really interesting. They're brightly colored. There's lots of different kinds. Um, you've got these really cool ones, these Christmas tree worms. Um, and this doesn't really look so much like an annelid, but you can see that those uh, bristles are well developed in them. Anyway, that's just a, another big group of annelids. We don't have them here in Kentucky, these sea worms, obviously, but that's just another class of annelids. Um, okay, so that's a brief introduction into the annelida. We're going to be dissecting some earthworms in lab, so I will see you then.